Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm more of a storyteller than a historian, particularly a computerized or analytical historian. So um, what I'm to say this afternoon might turn out to be the novel that I'll never write. <laughs> I have a short presentation to make but it is something that I've wanted to bring to the attention of uh, historians, uh, particularly Irish historians, for a long time. In the 1970s, I searched into the history of Gros Hill, the quarantine station near Quebec City. My interest arose from the fact that my father talked about it all the time because his father had been the designer of the monument, the, the Celtic Cross at Gros Hill. That station, as you know, is now a historic site managed by Parks Canada. It has several large burial grounds. You've heard that story. <clears throat> Around the uh, time that the uh, station changed from a military station to Agriculture Canada, I think uh, Darcy McGee was Minister of Agriculture at the time. In the research, particularly into the archives of the Diocese of St. Anne de la Pocatière, a Roman Catholic, I came across a packet of letters written by the priests at Gros Hill, written by, the, by these priests to the Bishop of Quebec during the summer of 1847. These were the men who served as chaplains during that summer. Around the same time, I met Rose Jean Pierre, who was doing research on Gros Hill, but from a completely different angle. She was looking at the story of the people who manned the quarantine station, employees at that time in the early period of Agriculture Canada. Our collaboration, Rose and mine, resulted in the book Eyewitness Gros Hill, which we published in both languages, um, Gros Hill, Les, Les Témoins Parles, 1847. And it's the contents of that Within that book are the contents of the particular document that I wanted to talk to you about. The priests in this case are the eyewitnesses. Where the priest had not written a report to his bishop, the work that he did in caring for the sick and burying the dead become his witness. In compiling the book, we had access to the Anglican Church Register of St. John the Evangelist, of Gros Hill, as well as the Catholic register of St. Luke of the island. And it is the Anglican register that I want to concentrate on this afternoon. At the beginning of the quarantine, and indeed into the later period, the imperial government and the Dominion government were both very solicitous about the presence of religion in people's lives in those days, something that is not quite the same today. There were two chapels on the island, an Anglican chapel and a Catholic chapel. The uh, Anglicans were expected to look after all the Protestant denominations. By the end of May 1847, Dr. George Mellis Douglas, the medical superintendent of the island, realized that this was no ordinary summer. His estimates of arrivals and the consequent needs from that based on his experience of the summer of 1847, proved to be terribly short of the mark. Besides the response, besides his response, there was a response of the military in their command of the island. And the Diocese of Quebec, the Catholic Diocese and the Anglican Diocese of Quebec came to uh, respond to those needs also. In the summer of 1847, there were 47 Catholic priests and 17 Anglican priests who served on the island, consoling the sick, giving the last rites to the dying, both in the hospitals, and you saw pictures of the lazarettos, which were the hospitals at the time, and on shipboard. At the very beginning of the summer, there, the buildings were inadequate and people were kept on board the ships, so the ships turned into hospital ships, which were pretty terrible. They also conducted the burial services at the vast graveyard on the western end of the island. Three Anglican priests and three Catholic priests died in, the, in service on that island, and four others in other parts of the province of Quebec and Ontario. 
These men, the 64 priests, left a record of their summer's work in the registers of the two parishes on Gross Hill. Um, I'll, I'll refer to these as Catholic and Anglican, even though there's Roman Catholic and Anglo-Catholic. You'll forgive me if I just use the terms Catholic and, and Anglican. I want to talk about the contents of the Anglican register. I'll compare, them to the, I'll compare the two registers and wonder over the difference, and I hope that you will wonder over the difference also. First of all, the priests. There were eight Irish-born Catholic priests and three Canadian-born of Irish parents. The rest of the 47 priests, Catholic priests, were French Canadians. The first ones called were those who had a little knowledge of English, and then towards the end of the summer, many others were dragooned into service. Um, um, I shouldn't have used the word dragooned. They were, they were called into service and served willingly. There were two. There were. <laughs> there were two. There were two sad cases of of, uh, of two men who just couldn't take it, and uh, after two days, left the island, beat it. But uh, there's a there's the making of a novel in that story. The um, there were two Irish-born Anglican priests, Richard Anderson and Richard Lonsdell. The other Anglican priests were English, Scottish, and Canadian-born. Father Bernard McGoran, originally from Sligo, but trained in Quebec, went to Grosil as the head of the first chaplains, O'Grady, McDevitt, McGuirk, and Tashrow. Tashrow later became Canada's first cardinal. It was on, uh, these men were on the island of Grosil, uh, um, uh, O'Grady was on the, uh, no, sorry, McGoran. McGoran was on the island for the whole month of May with his two Anglican counterparts, Reverend Charles Forrest and Reverend Armin Mountain, the son of the Anglican Bishop of Quebec. Bishop Mountain made his calculations from the information supplied by his son, and Bishop Mountain had um, calculated that 10% of the immigrants arriving in 46 and probably 47 were at least 10% were Protestants. And the information that is recorded in the registers is very uneven. Why is there such a difference? There is some very unscientific guesswork that comes into play here. In the Catholic register, which is kept in French, even by the Irish priests, the form is the same throughout. In the Anglican register, the priests recorded in individual style, and some of them recorded much more information than others did. The very first Catholic entry in the register of St. Luke of Grosil is the baptism of Owen Woods. The 15th of May, 1847, I, the undersigned priest, missionary in the island of Grosil, the island of St. Luke called Grosil, have baptized Owen, born at sea on the 21st of the preceding month of the lawful marriage of Henry Woods, Sawyer, absent, and of Anne Duffy of the parish of Anna Mullen in the county of Monaghan in Ireland. The sponsors, Patrick Coyle and Margaret Smith, who could not sign. Bernard McGoran, priest. The second entry is a sad one. On the 18th of May, 1847, I, the undersigned priest, have buried in the cemetery of the place the body of Ellen Kane, legitimate daughter of John Kane, weaver, and Bridget McNally of the parish of Kilmore in the county of Mayo in Ireland, who died the evening before, aged four years. Present, the mother who could not sign, and Hilaire Giroux, undersigned. Bernard McGoran, priest. The... Catholic register, as I said, continues in that style. However, in total, for the month of May, there are seven names registered by Father McGoran. But in a letter to Bishop Signae, the Bishop of Quebec, he says that there have been 135 Catholic burials. And Father Tashro says he buried 30, 55 on May 30th and 86 on June 3rd. The register ended on May 18th, and the next entry was the 16th of June. Now, if you look at the list of ships that are coming in at that moment, you realize why there's such a space, an empty space in the registers. They simply haven't had the time to write down the names of people. And in many cases, 
there were bodies carried off the ships. Once the ship reached the St. Lawrence River, they didn't throw the bodies overboard for burial because they might be washed up on the, on the shore. Uh, French phrase, c'est pas un cadeau. 